This book was written before the pandemic. So this was before the crazy. This was before the global trauma. And, and we're now in the cascade effects of all that global trauma, by the way. It's not over just because it's over. Um, yeah. The effects on the soul. But this was before all that. And I was watching, I, would, I was watching myself get fried by the pace of modern life, by the content, the amount of content that we just consider to be a normal consumption of data, media, Instagram, da 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 da, you know, texts from friends, all that great stuff. You have a lot of content coming at you. Welcome to Authentic Conversations. I'm your host, Ryan James Miller, and I believe the way to freedom, fulfillment, and success ultimately comes by living as the most authentic version of yourself. If you're ready to live the life you've dreamed of, you're in the right place. All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Authentic Conversations. This one is going to go down in history as definitely one of the top podcasts that I've ever done. Uh, If you are looking at this screen right now, you are looking at John Eldridge. Uh, If you're listening, you should probably just hop on to YouTube and watch this. Uh, John has been one of the most influential men, voices really in all of Christianity for decades decades. Uh, You will know him from the book Wild at Heart. If you are a Christian man and you have not read that book, I don't know what hole you have been living in uh, for the last uh, uh, quite a few years. Uh, In addition to that, he started Wild at Heart Ministries and he's done some incredible and continues to do incredible conferences uh, for Christians around the world. He's a speaker. He has written other books. Uh, We're going to talk about Get Your Life Back, which is just a been a profound book in my life. Uh, he recently uh, launched a book or released a book called Resilient. Uh, he is the founder of the One Minute Pause app. Uh, just so many incredible things that John has done in his life. And so I am excited today. But for now, John, thank you so much for giving some time today to be on the podcast. Thanks, Ryan. I, after that introduction, I, I think it's all downhill from here, folks. <laughs> It's impossible. It's How impossible do I live up to that. <laughs> God has just set this up too well. There's no way. And by the way, if you don't know John, all you really have to do is just look at what's sitting behind him in his view, which is a sword. And that alone just shows you how cool he is. Um, Okay, John, I, I do want to, I do really want to say this. And, you know, I, I shared with you just for a second offline before how grateful I am for this time. And I'll try to fight back as much emotion as I do this. But um, you have had the most profound impact, I'm sure, on hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people's lives. But me specifically, Um, you won't know this, but I experienced devastating tragedy back in 2017. I was a survivor of of the mass shooting in Las Vegas. Um, one of our best friends, uh, she was one of the 58 that was killed that night. And 2019, um, I experienced my first anxiety attack. I, I had never dealt with anything like that in my life. I was just struggling through so many things that year. I was a pastor of a church and so trying to wrestle with God through that whole thing. And um, towards the end of 2019, I started to really struggle with God around whether I was enough and I was doing enough. And I fell upon the one minute pause. And there is this line that you say at the end of all of the pauses that I've listened to, and I've, I've, I've done the one, three, five, tens, and, and, and you say this line in just the most calming and profound way, and you say, that's good, that's enough for now. Yeah. And I, I would really love to hear from you in, in the simplicity of a, wor- of a line like that, why was that so important for you to conclude something like that in that way? Well, the design of the pause is teaching people the wonderful practice of release. Mm. 
learning to let it all go. If only for a couple minutes every day, just learning to let it go. Mm. And but even a spiritual practice like that can begin to feel like um, I got to do this right. Mm. I got to get it right. I'm not doing it enough. I'm not, you know, people are trying to release and go. I'm not releasing enough. I'm not. And that's uh, that's just a really sneaky way for it all to get back in. So if I can end it by saying you're good, you're well, that's great. Well done. Everybody, well done. That's enough for mm. now. It, it just brings all that adrenaline, all that cortisol back down in the body, all the stress and tension in the soul. You just get to release it again as you, as you finish that. And what the fun story about the Pause app is we're not an app company. We don't <laughs> build apps, right? <clears throat> but I had found this practice of stopping a couple times a day, certainly at bedtime, and just releasing the people, the chaos, the email I regret sending, mm. all that stuff to God. Just let it go. It was it was so life giving to me that I began to teach my staff to do it. And we actually have monastery bells that go off in our offices every day at ten and two. And it's Whoa. very disruptive because you're on a phone call or you're starting a meeting. 10 o'clock is a really big meeting, like start time, you know. Yeah. And, and here these these bells just start ringing very, very beautifully, very, very softly as an invitation to pause. Mm. And it was so life giving for the staff. We're like, we we need to build an app. And my son, Luke, actually was the one who came to me with the idea. He says, let's put this in an app format and teach people how to do this. Wow. And <clears throat> Ryan, half a million people have downloaded that app. Is that the wildest story? It, it, it's so incredible to me because, again, so, you know, so that hit me so profoundly. 2020 obviously just ravaged every single one of our lives, and I was pretty faithful throughout most of 2020 uh, in the, uh, typically the three to five minute or the one and three minute ranges. And then 2021 just got the best of me, and I just kind of went back to my normal life. 2022 was very much the same. And then starting out this new year, so I am a part of a local church here in uh, Southern California called Southlands. And we have this men's group that's about 25 guys ranging from 14 to 80 years old. Uh, we have the fortune of Matt Redman being a part of that group with two of his sons. And um, so we decided that for this season, we were going to start reading your book, Get Your Life Back. And as we did, the first thing that came up for everybody as we read through the first chapter was we all need to do the pause app together. And so the stories of fruit across these 25 guys was just incredible. And it caused me to now my wife and I are going to bed almost every single night. And the last thing that we do is listen to one of the 10 minute pauses as we fall asleep at night. And it has brought, I mean, last night we listened to the one on love and it just like, it's just such a way to bring this center back to who God is and who God has created us to be. And it's been incredible. And I can understand, you know, again, when I, when I first started the pause, I didn't get it because it was just the app, but now reading the book, I'm actually, I want to read a quote uh, from the book. And then I want to hear some of your feedback here, because I think it's helpful for people to understand kind of why these things have all collided in the way that they did. So you say this, in the intro, actually, to get your life back, you said, I find myself, I found myself flinching when a friend texted me and asked for some time. I didn't want to open email for fear of the demands I find there. I had a shorter and shorter fuse in traffic. I felt numb to tragic news reports. It made me wonder, am I becoming a less loving person? I had little capacity for relationships and the things that bring me life, a walk in the woods, dinner with friends, a cold plunge in a mountain lake. When I did steal a moment for something life-giving, I was so distracted I couldn't enjoy it. 
You said, then I realized it wasn't a failure of love or compassion. These were symptoms of a soul pushed too hard, strung out, haggard, fried. My soul just can't do life at the speed of smartphones, but I was asking it to. Everybody's asking theirs too. And so I, I know that the process of writing, it, it, it takes on so many forms, but how, John, did you come to the conclusion that it was so necessary to pen this book and really start in a place of self-reflection where you realized you needed it so much yourself? Yeah, it's, it's important to put it in the context that um, this book was written before the pandemic. So this was before the crazy. This was mm. before the global trauma. And, and we're now in the cascade effects of all that global trauma, by the way. It's not over just because it's over. Um, yeah. The effects on the soul. But this was before all that. And I was watching, I, would, I was watching myself get fried by mm. the pace of modern life, by the content, the amount of content that we just consider to be a normal consumption of data, media, Instagram, da 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 da, you know, texts from friends, all that great stuff. Yeah. You have a lot of content coming at you. And so <clears throat> the, the real test is your reserves. This will be mm. a really good test. Like people go, yeah, 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 I've got some days where I'm a little more fried than another, but I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> if tomorrow a new pandemic rolls through the world, and everything goes back to where we were in the spring of 20. Stores are closed. Schools are closed. Your kids are at home. Church is closed. You're working online in the kitchen from your laptop. All that. <clears throat> you got to go. Everybody, we're all going back to that again. How does your soul react to that? Mm. How does your soul react to that, Ryan? I would feel, I think my immediate re response would be just this sense of absolute deflation yeah. only because, yeah. you know, as hard as I worked to get through it, it's like, I can't endure this all over again. Yeah, exactly. Right. Round two would be brutal. And, so, and that has to do with your reserves, because when you go through mm. something, I mean, my gosh, when you go through what you went through in Las Vegas and the months and years after that. You have to tap into your reserves to rally for life's big moments. And it, it could be the birth of a child. It could be a wedding. It could be, you know, planning a church or starting a new career. It doesn't have to be negative things. But you tap into your reserves. Hmm. And, and at some point, folks, those reserves are shot. And you have to intentionally replenish them. But the pace of life just keeps people going. Just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. I had a fascinating conversation with a, with a really interesting guy from Australia. He was a church planner. But he was also a business entrepreneur. In his city, Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world. They were 267 days in their homes. I mean, that, that's, that's a serious mind F, man. Like, that'll really mess with you. And it was only when I began to ask him, so how are you doing? That he began to locate, I'm, I'm fried. I'm shot. I, I'm, I'm doing well in my day to day, but my reserves are gone. And I, I said, buddy, I really hope that a sabbatical is part mm. of your future. Because at some point, you, you've got to get out of the madness and restore your soul. Yep. Yep. Well, I, I think that's the idea, too. When <clears throat> uh, later on in the book, you talk about benevolent detachment. And I think that, you know, one of the most loving things that we can do for ourselves is start to detach from the world that has created so much chaos for us. And, John, I think what's interesting, too, is, is especially now hearing you wrote this book pre-pandemic um, and then Resilient comes out. And from what I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm still interested to hear how you experienced this. I mean, you had, I'm sure over the course of your ministry, you have experienced so much devastation through yourself, through listening to other people, but you had a 
awful, awful tragedy happened to you in the tragic loss of your own son. Yeah, it was a grandson. <clears throat> okay, grandson. Yes. And so how, I mean, here you are, you're, you're, you're writing to encourage others, and I'm sure from your own life experience, to, to detach, to love yourself, to build up reserves. Hey, you know, there's this idea of resiliency, but you are having to endure it yourself. It's not like you're sitting on the mountaintop telling other people what to do. No. And so how do you experience something as devastating as that? Well, gang, <clears throat> I mean, my life is no different than anyone else's. We just had some very dear friends here two weeks ago, and he's in his last days of cancer. Mm. Um, our youngest son and daughter have been really struggling with the hard journey of infertility. I mean, this is just all around us, gang, like heartache, disappointment, loss. <clears throat> the thing is, is that I... I am deeply committed to life. I am deeply committed to the care of the soul. And so I, I navigate the same world that everyone else does, but with a lifestyle that's very, very different because of the choices I make. I don't spend very much time on the news mm. because it's it like, TMI, gang, like that, you don't need to know the tragedy of the world every stinking day. Like that is brutal on the soul. Yeah. I don't, I don't spend a lot of time on, on social media. I, I make choices every day. I listen to beautiful music in the evening, you know, things like that to care for the soul in a crazy hour like this one. Mm. Was it always that way for you, though? Mm, no. Oh, no. <clears throat> no, 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 no. I have fried several times in the course of my career. I, I have reached places where um, I'm like, babe, I can't keep going. I don't want to see people. I don't, I don't want to hear from people. I don't want another stinking project asked of me. Yeah, right. Um, and... And so that's good to hear. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, pe people, I, I think it's very easy, maybe even more so in Christianity than anywhere else for us to put certain people up on pedestals. Oh, yeah, and it's sure. like, yeah. you know, uh, John is the is the warrior out in the jungle and he's slaying <laughs> dragons with a sword. And he's like, yeah. you know, you know, his mind is so in line with the Lord that, you know, nothing, you know, nothing breaks in. And and so. It would probably be helpful. Uh, what are some of the things for you that start to weigh in on your challenges around keeping your mind right with the Lord and keeping your eye on the prize? Well, gang, um, <clears throat> the thing is, if you decide to become a friend of Jesus, then the enemies of Jesus become your enemies. Mm particularly in the spiritual realm. And you, you start coming under some pretty serious stuff. <clears throat> you get your head up above the foxhole and you start trying to help other people. Their enemies become your enemies. Mm. And so, um, yeah, I think it was real key. Um, the beautiful poet who said, you, you, as you mature as a man, <clears throat> you are simply going to face larger and larger enemies. And I have found that to be true in the course of my life. Yeah. So, so the question is, what will we do with that? Like, how, how will we live with that? Like, I, I pay attention to my soul. I know pretty quickly when I'm not doing well. I know pretty quickly when my thoughts are freely spinning out. Um, over a series of bad choices, run hard, push hard. You know, I've just made every, I've made all the mistakes I've paid I, I, for all my dumb decisions. I don't, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and this is the difficult thing in life is that most of the important lessons you've already learned, you've learned through pain. Mm. 
It would be lovely if we could learn them some other way, but it just doesn't seem to stick. But the lessons yeah. you learn through pain, those lessons stick. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So this is an interesting observation for me as you're talking about this. And again, you know, knowing your work to some degree. Um, so in, in today's day and age, we have very influential voices who you may be familiar with or not, but say somebody like David Goggins. And so David, his book, Can't Hurt Me, was so profound in the way he shared his life experience and just how hardened his mind is. But there's also this sense of, and I know he's not necessarily trying to do it. I think not having faith in Jesus also causes this, but he has created this this belief in people that we just need to keep grinding to get through whatever pain. I've I've actually grown to hate that word when we really think that this idea of grinding, which we celebrate, is taking something hard and solid and grinding it down to dust. Like, we don't want that. Yeah. And so that's one side of it. And, and, and Goggins would say, just keep hardening your soul, keep hardening your mind, keep hardening your heart, and you will endure anything. You can ultra marathon, climb the mountain, whatever. You write your own narrative around this idea of how to be and build resilience. And so where do wh- what is your thesis around this idea that we are going to endure pain. Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. I believe that's present day suffering. It's not some future sense of where we're going to be. Uh, and so how how do you build up this tolerance to and understanding of the wounds that we're going to experience and all the while continue to endure and run the race faithfully? Yeah, gang, <clears throat> here's the deal. If you keep building up calluses on your soul, you will numb out. Not only will you seal yourself off from pain, you will seal yourself off from joy. Mm. You will seal yourself off from happiness and love and laughter and the joy of goofing around. Like, come on. Um, That's not how you live life. That's Buddhism. Like it's, it's utter detachment. That's not the biblical way. And here's the really cool news. To be a human being is to be a vessel that God fills. Mm. That's what it means to have a humanity. All your faculties, your creativity, your sense of humor. Yeah, your perseverance, but also your playfulness. Like all of your humanity is meant to be saturated with the presence of the living God. Mm. That is how it works. We, we, we are deeply dependent creatures. Like, no matter what Coggins says, you still have to sleep every night. Right. You still have to eat. You can't go three days without water. Like, we're very, you can't go 10 seconds without a breath. You know, like, <laughs> right. come on, we are deeply <laughs> dependent creatures. So instead of um, advocating for a model of resilience that sounds a little bit like Navy SEAL stuff, um, which actually isn't because they're very tuned into recovery. And, you know, after you're on an assignment, you are in recovery and that sort of thing. However, the biblical view, Ryan, is as simple as this. The resilience of God is imparted into your humanity. He breathes into your humanity the healing, the restoration, the wholeheartedness through our union with him. Mm. The soul is made for union with God. And it's wonderful. It's delightful. It's a great way to live. Gosh, I, I, I just got caught up in, you know, in, in that moment for a second, because I, I think what's so amazing about the work that you've done and the way that you you do it is you are not separating the, the worldly attributes of 
humanity. You are not disconnect, disconnecting, you know, men, specifically biological men. You're not disconnecting us as men from our need to get out into the wilderness and to be men and to, to build and to hunt and to like, you, you're doing all of that, but then you have this way, and I am, John, so thankful for the way God has wired you because you just have this way to take all of this manliness and, and, and still just breathe sense of, such a sense of calm and compassion into the reality of the world that we live in. And it's, it's just, it's fascinating to me, uh, that you can embody both the way that you do. How, so there, there, there's a lot of guys out there that, that want that, but it's not something that they grew up with. They just, they don't, you know, we're told to, uh, my generation, I'm 45. So my generation, you know, was, was trailing off of yours in the sense of like, we grow up, we're tough. Uh, we fall down, we break something, we get up, we dust it off. We, we just move on now in today's day and age. Thankfully you don't watch too much of the news, right? But we have such a distorted view of masculinity that we don't yeah. even know what anything is anymore. But yeah. how do you encourage men specifically to, to, to develop that, that muscle around sensitivity and compassion and empathy for themselves and for other people. Yeah. Yes. You're a beautiful interviewer, Ryan. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to save that clip. I'm going to save that clip. <laughs> uh, um, okay, gang, let, let's just first name a couple things. Your masculinity is filled with dignity. It mm. is a gift from God. In Genesis 1, it literally says, this is how you bear the image of God, either <clears throat> in your masculinity or for a woman in her femininity. Gender is filled with dignity and beauty. Now, gender has come under a great deal of harm, trauma, assault. Yes, I understand that. But the core issues are still um, holy. They're really, really holy. <clears throat> Masculinity, if I were to boil it down, it is strength on behalf of others. That's how it works. So you develop strength and you develop compassion. Now, you were, you were asking about the compassion side, the, the tender side, the, yeah. So, like, even just emotional awareness, like cultivating emotional awareness as a man, um, it, it, those are very, very important things. I call that the lover stage of masculine development. And it's not mm -hmm. just falling in love, uh, but the lover stage is the awakening of the heart. It's when you find an author that you love. And you're like, oh my gosh, this poetry is amazing. You find movies that you love, or you, you love a certain director. You love his films, like a Wes Anderson. <clears throat> you, you start noticing nature like you never had before. You get in your car in the morning and the raindrops on the windshield and you just go, whoa, that is so stinking beautiful. It's the awakening of the heart. And it is very masculine, mm. right? It is. It's the warrior poets, right? It's the blending of the fears with emotional health, sensitivity, well-being. That's the only thing, by the way, gang, that's going to see you through this life. You can't live with just one of those. You can't just live with emotional intuition uh, because without the strength, you're just going to get clobbered out there. Um, I mean, life is brutal. Uh, yep. If you just have the strength and you're not in tune with, you know, the, your heart, well, you're going to develop an addiction um, or you'll develop depression. Well, you know, one of those two things will happen. Something, something will begin to help you medicate what you're not paying attention to. So we need both. We need yep. both. And the beautiful thing is Jesus illustrates both. He is incredibly courageous, unbelievably brave when you need him to be strong. And then in the next moment, he's the kindest guy you'll ever meet. He says the tenderest things to people. It's just yeah. remarkable. Oh, so good. 
um, as I reflect back on my own story and, and many people have heard it. Um, so that experience in Las Vegas was just this catalyst. I came to faith in 2006 on the back end of a near divorce and, uh, almost, uh, being unfaithful to my wife. And, um, but it was that moment that really catalyzed, um, me to go back into, the very early days of my life and started to examine all of the ways that others inflicted and Mm self-inflicted wounds calloused me to become something that I wasn't. Um, Definitely far more so before I was a Christian, but even afterwards, continuing to peel back those layers was so difficult because as those wounds are inflicted, we... We, 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 we fight back against them or we just try to rush past them and get over them. But I know one of the things that you've talked about a lot is this idea of redemptive suffering. The theme has come up a few different times. And so as I'm, I'm actually, I'm writing a book myself right now and I'm, I'm really excited to tell that story, but I would, mm. I would really love for you to share, um, through all of this, because I think that y- you have uh, given examples today and just through writing and through, through story and sharing, you've shared so many physical wounds that you've incurred, but you've also talked a lot about the emotional and spiritual wounds, which is all part of this idea of soul care. So it's come from everywhere. And so people listening today are either sitting in one of those at the moment or they have, a, a, you know, in the very near past. And so. What do you say to that as it relates to this idea of redemptive suffering? Because as Christians, we read the book of Job, right? And and we're like, oh my gosh, that was awful. That was tragic. That was devastating what happened to him. Um, and in the end, uh, it, it's like this beautiful story of everything comes back to Job and then some. And so I think that like we see it, but we don't always see it for what it really is, uh, even when we read stories like that. So h- how do you see that and how do you see redemption happening, maybe even when it doesn't happen the way that we think it should? Yeah, right. Or in the time frame that we would like it to <laughs> yes. happen it, yeah. which <laughs> is immediately, please. Yeah. yeah. Yesterday. <clears throat> Yesterday. <laughs> yeah, come on. Let's get this over with. All right. So let's say this. Every single soul is profoundly wounded. Every human being is. You don't get through this broken world without it. And in an hour like ours, I would add, and traumatized as well. Mm. It's just, it just, we live in a very traumatizing world. This is very, this is not Eden, folks. Like this is, we've had as many shootings in this year as there have been days so far. So, like, gang, this is a, and just honestly, okay, this will blow your mind, Ryan. After 9-11 happened, they, they did a fascinating study that the people who watched the Twin Towers go down on television had the same level of PTSD as the people who were watching it in New York live. And this has to do with the brain's inability to filter information and to differentiate between what images are real and what images, you know, this is why movies work. Why do movies, you know, yeah. movies work because your brain's like, whoa, we're in outer space or whoa, we're on a ship, you know. Okay. <clears throat> the point I was making is that every person is carrying wounds and trauma. Now, some of that can be healed simply by paying attention. You know, if you will grieve, your griefs, you can actually keep a pretty short list of things. If you can just walk out of you walk out of a hard thing and you go, whoa, that was brutal. I am heartbroken. And you begin to name it and grieve it. You, I mean, there's a lot of life that actually you can heal by living well, by living in touch. But most of the wounds of our childhood in particular need us to go back, revisit the wound uh, in order to find healing. And so mm-hmm. what is redemptive suffering? I'm going to tell you something that sounds crazy. What you do is you walk right into the center of your pain. Mm. This is why masculinity is courage. Okay, you walk right into the center of it. You go back and I was raised in an alcoholic home. I had a totally detached mother. 
Um, those are sources of enormous pain. <clears throat> you walk right back into the memories. You walk right back into the source of that. And, and you begin to invite the presence of Jesus. Mm. Because the soul is healed by its creator. And, and he is able to walk with us back into pain, back into suffering, back in memories. He literally heals the soul. Now, some of us are going to need a good therapist to do that. Okay. Hmm. I, I've been a Christian therapist for almost 35 years, so I really believe in it. Um, but I would also add, if you, if you walk in touch with your emotional life, you grieve your griefs. You put words to your disappointments. A lot of, a lot of healing can come through uh, the beauty of this world. Nature heals. Beauty heals. Mm. There's, in other words, it doesn't all have to be counseling. It doesn't all have to be trauma intensives. I, I do them. I, I go do them. I do them for my own self is what I'm saying. As a client, yeah. I do them. Yeah. Um, but... But a lot of life, if you'll live in touch, gang, grieve your griefs, name your pain, love God there, he will meet you. I love how beautifully that illustrates verses like, you know, Hebrews 4, 15, when it talks about the fact that, you know, Jesus is able to empathize with our weakness. He, he understands our temptation and our suffering. But what again? You've done so well for people as we're as we're listening, and I'm I'm just listening in the same way that everybody else is uh, at this moment. But you create this beautiful roundedness in, in saying that it's it's always about Jesus, but it's not only about the over spiritualized or spiritualized sense of Jesus in the way that, and you do this so well, John, when you write every single time, and I think it's because it's the way you live your life. But when you talk about getting out into the wilderness, experiencing the beauty that's around us, again, going back to get your life back, there was this, uh, I don't remember where it was, but in, in that chapter on beauty, I was reading it in the beginning and I was like, this really isn't for me. Like I, I definitely see the beauty around me. Um, but, um, and then the more I read, what was so interesting to me was, was while nature was beautiful and things were beautiful, the, the thing that reminded me most about the beauty of God and the way he has worked in my life was when I thought about my wife. Mm. And we, we, in our group, we went around and we shared about that. And when it got to me, they were kind of stuck for a second. They're like, no, 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 it's not about your wife being beautiful. And I said, well, first of all, it is like she's beautiful. But I said, the way that God has worked in my life in redeeming storing and redeeming my marriage, the way that God has created this woman that has endured the craziest seasons of life that runs the pace that I do. Like she is one of the most incredible examples of the beauty of what Jesus creates to restore my soul. Yeah. And so Thank you again, because it's like, again, you do that so well. I think that especially in Christianity, we, we, we kind of push so hard into the spiritual, though all things are spiritual, but we, we, we push so hard into that, that sometimes it gets hard to understand the practical that's around us. Yeah. And so you create such great tension. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would, I would bet if we had a half an hour to unpack the story with your wife, that what we would discover is that one of the richest experiences of beauty has been mercy. Mm. There is something about a, a wholehearted woman, a brave, loving woman that brings mercy to the world. Now, this is a fascinating thing, Ryan, because I know we're talking a lot around guys right now. Did you know that little boys actually need more comfort from their mothers than little girls do? Wow. No. And you, oh, it's so counterintuitive because you think, oh, no, you know, he's going to grow up to be the, the tough guy. Kind of, well, he will grow up with emotional resilience if he receives mercy from his mother. 
Okay. I did Mm. not. And so I'm speaking firsthand to know what that deprivation is like. But how how do we experience healing in our current journey? Mercy. Mm. Mercy. And and to ask, to say, God, I need the experience of mercy. And he will bring it in your life through people, through circumstances, through a, a song that you hear will just bring you to tears because of the mercy in it. Hmm. So good. <laughs> okay, we're getting ready to land the plane. Um, and uh, do you have any final word? And again, we had no preparation for this discussion at all. But uh, as we've talked around this idea of soul care and suffering and resilience, is there any kind of final word that you feel compelled to share to an audience that's out there listening? Maybe some never have heard of you before. There's quite a few that are not Christian, um, but everybody is in some place of, of needing relief from where they're at. The, the, <clears throat> I would love to say 16 things, um, but we don't have time. We, can have, we have all the time in the world. Well, if like. <laughs> but it's, it, it's actually not helpful because too, yeah. Yeah, too much content um, you, is actually not helpful. I would recommend that you get the One Minute Pause app. Mm. It's free. It's on the App Store, iPhone and Android. You, you will find in there a daily experience of the things that Ryan and I are talking about. You'll find in there a very simple practice that will bring mercy, that will bring sanity, that, that will bring God closer into your soul's actual daily experience. So, I mean, I could say a lot of things, but honestly, I would go do that. Yeah. That's so good. (laughs) There was a million things that you could have said, and yet that is so perfectly profound because it is also so simple. Um, And I would encourage you guys to do the same thing. It's not because John is on the other side of this microphone or screen. I mean, that pause, even just the one minute alone has changed my life. I listen to it twice a day. I'm usually doing more than a minute twice a day. But in addition to that, I've challenged myself to listen to the one minute before and after every coaching call that I'm on, after every meeting that I'm on, before I go to lunch, when I come back. It's giving me the opportunity to transition through all of the chaos of my life Mm -hmm. with a moment of peace with the one who created me and has given me the life that I'm living every single day. So go listen to that, download it. We're going to put that link into the show notes. Uh, We'll also put links to uh, the website, wildatheart.org. That's where you can go find all things John Eldridge and his whole team. John, Um, I've said it a lot and I'm just going to keep saying it. You are an absolute gift to my soul, Mm. to my life, um, to this world. And so thank you for the ways that you have, that you have faithfully Mm. run this race that God has set you on. And I pray that you continue to faithfully do so with strength, with courage that you talk about so often, but also with the tenderness that God has put in your soul. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, You're a beautiful guy. You really are. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. For all you guys out there listening, man, I'll say it as direct as can be right now. If you don't know Jesus and you've listened to this entire conversation, this is the one. Uh, We didn't ask you to raise your hand, to pray some prayer. I am saying to you right now that the only way you will ever reconcile everything that happens in this world and to you is by understanding the God who created you. And so I challenge you to consider that for yourself, to know that God loves you, to know that God died for you, to know that God has secured you, not just in this life, but for all of eternity. And so I challenge you to that today. Thank you for your support, for your love, for the for the times that you guys have given feedback, that you've shared this podcast with other people. Um, I wouldn't be able to do this without you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait for another episode of the podcast coming up real soon. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Authentic Conversations. If you are ready to live the life you've dreamed of, I'm here to help. Head to ryanjamesmiller.com slash podcast to begin your journey. 
And if this episode impacted you in any way, pay it forward by sharing it with someone you know. I'm Ryan James Miller, and I'll see you next time on Authentic Conversations.